identified four victims and plan on more than just the four murder charges filed today. Take the plunge. Cold plunging can boost everything from your mood and energy to performance and recovery. Right now, Plunge is offering an exclusive discount of $250 off your order with code HOLIDAY250. Save now at plunge.com. Well, let's big up, get back to the show. Uh, you can find us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and um, YouTube. Just type in Grinding True Crime. There you can find our page, like our page, subscribe to our page, leave a comment on our page, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. You can also listen to us on your podcast stream. Just go to Podbean, Spotify, Anchor, iTunes, Pandora, and Podmine, along with Zencaster. And for those listening to us outside of the U.S., you can continue to listen to us on Radio Public, Breaker, Pocket Cast, and Podchaser. If you like what you hear and you want to become a Patreon member, you can do so exclusively on Podbean. Uh, there you can uh, become a Patreon member. Uh, Patreon member, um, we support everything that you do, and we uh, want to thank you guys for the ones that are already Patreon members, so we want to thank you for that. Um, listeners' discretion is advised, because we do get into details and might not be suitable for a certain audience, <laughs> so listeners' discretion is advised. Also, we're going to have merchandise on the way pretty soon, so be on the lookout for that. Um, we'll announce when we're going to start uh, launching it, but merchandise is on the way soon. Okay, <clears throat> with all that being said, I think I got everything, correct? I think so. All right, we thank you guys once again. Well, let me stop talking because I sound like a horse. So I'm gonna let Top <laughs> Fox take over so he can uh, do his episode for tonight. Top Fox, you have the floor. All right, thanks, Matt. Uh, it's a good thing you're not a horse because we'd have to take you out behind the barn and put you out of your misery. You know, the voice you, is bad. You're being, <laughs> you're being very disrespectful, sir. Either that or give you a basketball and you can play in the WNBA, but uh, that's a story for another day. You're being very disrespectful. <laughs> You're being very disrespectful. You made me lose my voice right now. <laughs> All right. So as you know, last week's story was in Colorado, and I figured, you know what? Let's do a two for one. Let's stay in Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're, we're back in Colorado, but this time we're on the Western the case. Say again. Is it a Kenda case? It is one that he reviewed. He wasn't one of his oh, cases, okay. but it's one that he reviewed, yes. Okay. Nice. Yeah, so this one's in Aurora, Colorado. <clears throat> and um, it's it's not the it's it's close to the big metropolis of Denver, Colorado as well. Um I've been there. Yeah, Aurora, Colorado has a population of about three hundred and eighty six thousand uh people. Um, it's known for its World War II Army hospital from when the GIs would come back from horrific injuries or whatever, rehabilitation, big time surgeries, things like that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> also, the Lawry uh, Air Force Base, I think I'm saying that right, and the Buckley Air Force Base are over there as well. Um, it's known as, as a pretty damn safe city, um, but you wouldn't think of you wouldn't think of it because uh, of what's gone on there. And if you think of Aurora, uh, Colorado, um, it's been the site of two mass shootings. Um, you had Columbine, Columbine High Schools in Aurora. Um, it's oh. where, where two students back in uh, the early 90s uh, uh, killed 12 students and one teacher and had pipe bombs that did not thankfully go off. Um that would have killed a lot more kids. Um, then you also had the 2012 mass shooting and the premiere of Dark Knight Rises, the Christopher mm, Nolan series. That. Yeah. Uh, James Holmes dressed up like the Joker and came in with a um, semi-automatic or I think it was an automatic uh, or AK or something. I, f I forgot what he came in there with. So don't kill me for not knowing the right weapon. But uh, he killed 12 people and injured 70. I remember that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Wasn't that the movie theater? Yeah, he, he came in the movie theater of the Dark Knight Rises, the premiere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, he shot the whole place up. Um, But this would be another incident um, that would make Colorado famous. And this was a case that was solved not too long ago. 
So oh. this was in the news not too long ago. Um, so let's let's get it started. Uh, but we're going to go back in time. <clears throat> we're going to go back to the year 1984. Ooh. So you were the only one born, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was four years old, punk. Uh, hey. <laughs> My sister was born. <laughs> guys are jerks. I'm always the oldest one in the world now. You are. <laughs> Unfortunately. We came a couple of years later. Yes. That's what she said. Um, so well, January <laughs> January 4th, 1984, um, was any particular night in the Colorado area. Uh, watching TV late that night was James Hobbins' child. Um, he was 22 years old. That's his name? <laughs> yeah. That's his name. Hobbins' child, yeah. It's the last okay. name. Hobbins? <laughs> Hobbins? <laughs> yeah. Hobbins' child. <laughs> So <laughs> I'm making fun of his name. It was just very unique. Yeah, it's very unique. There's a lot of unique names in this one. So I believe you. That's yeah. one of them. That is definitely one of them. Um, so he's 22 years old. Uh, he took out the trash, um, but he forgot to shut the garage door. You know, he has one of these homes that it's like, you know, you have the exit from the kitchen or the hallway to the garage and the garage outside. So Sometimes I've been guilty of it. I have one of those at my house too, but just not the door to the house. But when I go back into the house, sometimes I forget to shut the garage door and it's just, you know, mm-hmm. your mind gets in a trance or whatever. And you forget to do it. I have it. Yeah. So this is about late at night that night. And, um, he went back inside and this will take you back to the eighties. A friend of his was a workout fiend and owned his own, um, gym and wanted him to make a mixtape for him. So he was making a mixtape on an actual actual cassette player at the time. So he had his headphones on. Ah, the mixtapes. Yep. He was making a, an aerobic workout, you know, for, for that dude's class, um, you know, soundtrack. So as he's doing that, um, he's sitting in the easy chair, turns off his TV. And then um, halfway through it, he's getting a little tired. It is late. And he just knocks out. Hmm. But he wakes up to his head ringing. So oh. someone hits him over the head with a hammer. Oh, ouch! Yeah. So his next instinctive move is to put his hand up to stop the second blow. The problem is the second blow is coming from the claw uh, handle part of oh, the hammer. Dang. Ouch! So it goes directly into his hand. And then it's mm. yanked right back out by the person swinging it at him. So then <clears throat> his wife, who was upstairs at this time, she was asleep. She came running down after she heard him scream and heard the first, you know, hit. And I don't know. I mean, it's hard to picture this, but she comes down the stairs and immediately he just takes the hammer and just launches it like and throws it at her her head and just kn- clocks her right upside the head Damn. Damn. and she just hits the floor and knocks the hell out and then he's trying to like look at his hand because it's like all like inflamed and there's like a chunk missing and the dude just gets freaked and the perpetrator runs out the way he came in which was through the, the entryway to the house from the garage Yo. so yeah, so she was concussed right away, and James calls, you know, the police department. His wife, Kim, is, you know, on the ground. Um, the police come, and here's the thing. <clears throat> now, we don't know what was what she was thinking at the time. It's hard to picture things. Things must have happened so fast, but like I said, as soon as she came down the stairs, she says that the last thing she remembered is a black guy hitting her and it's dark. It's like pitch black. The dude was making the mixtape with his Walkman or whatever he had um, little stereo right there in the easy chair. It's dark. And James didn't even get a view of, he, he never saw the person cause he was just trying to, he was looking at the hammer. So he, mm-hmm. he couldn't tell what race the dude was, but she was like in emphatical. She's like, it's a black guy. It's, gotta be a black guy and and so that's what the police were going off of 
So they were looking for a suspect that was, you know, he left a shoe print outside, had a, like a size nine, size 10, a black guy. But they went through the neighborhood and that neighborhood's mostly white and no, mm-hmm. saw, nobody saw a black guy. Nobody saw a black guy. It's late at night too, but there was a couple people outside and nobody saw a black guy. So it was like, okay, well, you know, did he maybe exit another way? So the cops are kind of baffled right there. Mm. I think she got it wrong, huh? Well, we'll see, but that's you guys. So, so do you think she got it wrong too, Matt? I mean, it's the eighties. It was an easy choice to pick a black guy. No, I'm joking. Um, honestly, uh, I've been on Aurora. It wasn't too many of us, so I'm gonna say she was wrong. Okay, yeah, you're you're playing the percentages. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Colorado's not known for its uh its black population. Just saying, it's not at all. It's mostly white. I'm not uh, saying nothing about it. It's no, nice there's nothing. Place. You know, I'm just yeah, yeah. It's just the 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 makeup of the area. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I love Colorado. Yeah. Uh, so now we fast forward six days. It's January 10th of 1984. And Donna Dixon, she's in her garage getting ready to get into her house. And the same kind of setup with this house. You know, park the car in the garage, get your belongings out, walk five or six steps to the door, go up a step or two and into your house from the garage. That's what anyone would do in that situation. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately... She doesn't Mm. make it out of her car very far, maybe two and a half steps before she's hit over the back of the head with a hammer. Donna Dixon at the age of 28 hits the floor. And before she can realize it, she's then hit again with Mm. a hammer two or three more times, including one time with a claw hammer in the back of the neck. Ouch. Yeah. She's on the floor. And then again, like Matt said at the beginning of this episode, listener discretion is advised. Um, there is a savage rape that takes place oh. after she is unconscious. And <laughs> he violates her with himself and also the hammer. Oh. Yeah. And then he left her for dead as he left outside the, the uh, garage the um, police were notified after um, a neighbor stumbled upon her lifeless body on the ground. And basically they ran, they ran over there and tried to get her. uh, What is it called? Um, They tried to, to to see if they could find the assailant, but, and then they tried to revive her and, and actually their efforts worked. Oh, wow. Yeah, they took her to the trauma center, and she actually made it. Wow. Yeah, uh, he thought she was dead, but he he knocked her cold out. Um, so these two, these two cases, I mean, would you say with the the mo with, I mean, a gun is one thing, you know, people use different guns or whatever, but these are two hammer attacks in two same similar homes. The only difference with this one is there's there's a rape. And there, in both instances, including this one, the perpetrator had time to ransack the house or to ransack her purse. Nothing was taken. So, <laughs> yeah, taken. <laughs> so, and similar, huh? Exactly. And the police, the police were like, "Oh, these are these are isolated instances." What? They didn't connect the two. Mm-hmm. Isn't it obvious? Six days apart. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and and again, I mean, look, if you have a hammer attack in California, that's usually probably the only hammer attack that's going to happen for a while, or or that it's going to be like in one area. It's you might not have another hammer attack in the United States for a day or two. You know what I mean? Like like it's yeah. it's, it's rare. And this is within six days and in the same city. Yeah, no. Mm-hmm. It's almost not doing their job. Mm-mm. Yes. As you'll find out in this one, there is an awful lot of Johnsons working these cases. We haven't had oh. some in a while. No. <laughs> yeah, the last couple were good, but uh, these, uh, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. 
I, I, I honestly don't know. So, like I said, Donna, despite her injuries, would go on and survive. But, of course, she would have a little bit of brain loss because of the blows to the head. And she would also suffer some severe PTSD over the years. Oh, so, absolutely. So, so poor thing had to rehab and, and everything. Just well, but, she never got a chance to see this guy, huh? No. Um, no. No. She she was hit from behind, so she has no idea. Um, and that sucks. Yeah. And and here's here's the worst part of it. So this is January 10th we're talking about, right? And mm-hmm. um that was around the morning time. We're talking seven hours later now, same day. Oh, no. Same day. The assailant is not done. So it's uh it's it's towards the evening time, and it's the next city over, which is like, you know. Downey to Cerritos or whatever. It's like right next door. Mm -hmm. Um, So in a smaller city called Lakewood, Colorado, uh, Patricia Louise Smith, age 50, was supposed to be on her way to pick up her daughter at the bus station outside her job. It was Mm -hmm. a routine for for the mother-daughter combination. She would pick up her daughter in the evening time and then drive her over to the babysitter's house to pick up her kids. So Sherry was her daughter. And uh, she would pick up her two kids. However, the mom didn't come at the agreed upon time. And she was out there in the cold waiting for her mom. So then she called one of her coworkers to see if they can give her a ride home. And they were able to and also pick up her kids. So she picked up her kids on the way home, but then asked the coworker, can you please stop by my mom's house? I, I've got to f- check on her because it's not like her for, n- for her not to pick up and for her not to be here. She's always punctual so the co-worker was like okay i'll take you to the house so they arrive at patricia's house and as they pulled up they looked up to the second story of the the condominium or the house and they could see like there was a tv on so she's like well maybe mom fell asleep or something and then she looked over towards the garage and the garage was half open And then she looks at the front door, the lights are on. So she's like, well, let me walk up. I have a spare set of keys. You know, I'll just, I'll, you know, cause she knocked on the door, she rang the doorbell and nobody answered. So Mm. she then starts to bustle with the keys, starts to unlock the doors and her two small children are, they want to see grandma. They're all excited. They don't know what's really going on. And they burst into the door before the mom could grab them, Sherry. And they stumble upon their grandma on the floor in a pool of blood. Mm. She has a Winnie the Pooh blanket draped over her head. And there's blood everywhere. So right away, Sherry grabs her. She screams and she grabs her kids and she walks outside and then to the neighbor's house to call 911 because you don't know if the perpetrator is still in the house. Mm -hmm. So it was a horrific scene. Um, 911's called, police get there, and a, se- and a senior detective was horrified to see that she had been bludgeoned over and over in the head. Mm. And, and the weapon was still there. It was the hammer, and the claw end of the hammer was sticking out of her out of her skull. Oh. Yo. Yeah. What a horrible vision for those kids. Yeah. I mean... It was bad enough that, I mean, they didn't thankfully see the head wounds, but they did see the pool of blood and their grandma on her stomach. And the also, the also, also another bad part of this is the fact that her pants and panties were pulled down to her ankles. She had been sexually. Yep. Okay. I don't know. This seems like somebody like, what's the... Richard Ramirez type guy, kind of like a homeless person or, or someone who's in the neighborhood and the low life and just an opportunist. Like a scumbag, huh? Yeah. He has the ammo. And, and here's the thing with it, too. Like, her purse was right there. It was emptied out. But from what her daughter said, only a few dollars were missing. Like, there wasn't, like, she had still her jewelry on. Um, she had some pretty nice things throughout the house. And nothing was taken or taken. Taken? Taken? 
Either one, whatever you want to put in there. But whatever yeah. floats your boat. Exactly. We do that on the show. <laughs> exactly. We're educated. <laughs> <laughs> we, we took in the wrong way of English, but. Uh, yeah. um, um. No, seriously, like that sounds like to me, you know, like like a crackhead, you know, or a meth head, or someone who's just want to get a quick fix and take an opportunity is to get some from a, you know, essentially a dead corpse. And I don't know, I don't think, I'm not saying um, a normal human being would do, would not do something like that, but that just screams someone that's like transient or something. Like on drugs? On drugs or something. Yeah, you would think so. You'd think the police would be looking for people that were just out of place in the neighborhood, you know? <clears throat> yeah. And yeah, but if that was the case, then it would be sporadic. Like it wouldn't be within the same neighborhoods. Yeah, because this was a city over. And remember, remember how many times like you guys have done a case, I've done a case where it's like the police never work with each other, even mm-hmm. if they're in the very next town. Mm-hmm. Well, this is Lake. Yeah, this is Lakewood, and they did not contact Aurora or any other agency to say, "Hey, we got something here." Does anyone else know of anything? I don't know why they don't do that. Um, I mean, damn competition. Yeah, I know they. I know they got jurisdictions, and you know, our side is better than your side. But you're serving the people. Who? who what? What does it matter? Yeah, you know? it's about saving. It's lives. about saving lives and protecting and serving the people or the country, however you want to look at it. So put your pride aside, put your badge aside, wherever it may be, and try to help these people out. I couldn't agree more. I mean, and this is a thing. I mean. Thankfully, they have rules and regulations to now they have to do that, especially after 9-11. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But back then, this was this was the way they did things, like you guys were saying, the, you know, egos and not wanting to share information. So, <clears throat> you know, lives could have been saved back then from our stories that we've done. I'm not saying we, you know, could have saved lives, but I'm just saying if, if they would have done that, you know, called another jurisdiction, uh, this town over, so many countless of lives could have been saved. Yeah, they could have stopped some of these serial killers like halfway through their their demonistic ways, you know? Mm-hmm. So this was, again, 1984. You're a good mm, seven to eight years away from the very pre-dawn, you know, of, of the DNA. Mm-hmm. But they did collect some DNA samples, which is key for later on. Okay. You know, blood and then also semen um, but there was no fingerprints that was one thing they were looking for and <clears throat> they figured the guy must have had gloves on mm. so and maybe that's why he didn't take things either he didn't want to leave fingerprints or whatever but uh, yeah they, so they, they took the DNA and everything else like that but um, you know or at least the, the semen samples blood samples and stuff and that was it so and then here's the other thing so now you have two occurrences in Aurora, and you have one in Lakewood. It's in the Denver, Colorado area. This should have been reported to the media. And the media, the newspapers, it was kept quiet. Nobody knew of these attacks. <clears throat> mm. So mm. that's the thing that's going to be a problem. Because maybe if you also let the people know, hey, make sure your doors and garage doors are locked or closed maybe some of these other things wouldn't take place. Agreed. Yeah. So the detectives, though, do say that this person or persons have done this before and that they're very, very dangerous. Yet again, hey, that guy's very dangerous. Should we tell the people? Nah, it's okay. All right. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's that's how it went down, you know? Back there watching some old Perry Mason, you know, like I don't get it. Why they gotta watch Perry Mason? Not, well, it was popular at the time during the eighties. <laughs> that is stupid, though. Like you, you got somebody breaking into people's homes, just walking and killing them. Like you gotta let people know. You would think so. That should be breaking news. Should be. And newspapers were a thing back then, and they they would have taken that and run, ran with it. You know what I mean? But um, <laughs> what? no, I'm laughing because every time he says "took it no laughing," because I have a feeling someone on our comments is going to say it's taken. You know, someone's probably doing a shot, you know, contest. Every time he says "took in," we're going to take a shot. <laughs> that should that should be good. That should be a good one for the listeners. Seriously, there you go. 
Um, so now here's a here's a part that I can't joke about, and, and unfortunately, you know, I gotta <clears throat> you gotta be totally hundred percent serious. We've been pretty serious this entire episode, but this one um, this one's brutal. And again, listener discretion is advised. There is crimes against children in this one. Oh mm. man. Yeah, so I apologize in advance, but this is just what happened. Um, so Constance Bennett um, is is the uh, aunt right here, and she's outside the city, outside of Lakewood and, and Aurora, about 10 or 15 minutes away. Her brother is, uh, and her, um, what is it called? Uh, her brother, Bruce and Deborah, um got a uh, you know worked for her uh, family business which was a furniture company right and her nephew uh, or uh, their nephew was was Bruce let me start over I messed up so Constance (laughs) has a brother that runs the furniture company it's been in the family for a while and her Mm -hmm. kids or her one of her kids is Bruce that's her son Mm -hmm. which is her brother's nephew there you go Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, he's married to a woman named Deborah, and they both work for the family business. Now, however, that particular morning on on uh, January 16th, we're just six days away from the last attack. Hey, La Puente, there's a new 7-Eleven in town, now open at 135 South 3rd Ave. Find all your favorites like Big Bite Hot Dogs, Pizza, Taquitos, Big Gulps, and Slurpees. Everything you need to get back on the go. Check out what's new with coffee from 7-Eleven and be sure to grab one of our delicious fresh bakery items like a cookie or muffin. Visit the new 7-Eleven, now open at 135 South 3rd Avenue and download the 7 Rewards app to score free food and drinks. They do not show up to work because they worked at the same time, same place, same furniture store. So, So their uncle, which is Constance's brother, calls Mm -hmm. Constance and says, hey, do you know where your son and daughter-in-law are at? I tried calling them. It's not like them. They didn't come in. They're a no-call, no-show. What the heck's going on? Is everything okay? Do I need to know something? So Constance right away had a sinking feeling in her stomach. And like any other mother would react, she just told her boss, I'm going, I I have to go home. I have to check on my son. And, And her son's 27. She's around 50. You know, she just has a sinking feeling. So it's Bruce Allen Bennett. That's her son, 27 years old. Um, His wife, Deborah Lynn Bennett, 26 year old. Uh, They have two daughters, Melissa Marie Bennett, seven years old, and Vanessa Bennett, three years old. Constance takes off, drives the 20 minute drive in 10 minutes, gets there, immediately sees the garage is open. The door is ajar, so that's already a bad sign. Mm. Here's a tough part. When she stepped inside of the house, she looked to the left where the stairs are leading up to the upstairs floor. She sees her son with his leg twisted between the um, stairway and his head cocked back to the side. His throat had been slit. Uh. He had a claw hammer mark to his face that had dislodged his jaw from oh yeah yo and he had two to three puncture wounds in his head oh my god the force that you have to pull yeah Ooh. so he's he's tangled on his back lying on the bottom of the stairs with his arms stretched out to the right like he's trying to grab somebody probably his last move he's trying to stop whoever it was from getting upstairs to the rest of his family Mm. so adrenaline's taking control of Constance at this moment and she doesn't know whether or not to go upstairs because she's horrified of what she may see number one and number two She doesn't know if the assailant's still there, so she instinctively just screams out for the kids and for his wife, Deborah, but nobody says a thing, and it's eerily quiet, so she just runs outside, starts screaming to where she gets the attentions of the neighbors, and then they call 911. And just minutes later, police would rush into the home and find Deborah 
laid out on their bed in their room with several wounds to the head. She's passed away. Then they get to the bunk where the two children are, and here's where it gets really rough. Mm. On the bottom bunk, the seven-year-old has been hit over the head multiple times, and her pants and underwear are pulled down. She had been raped. We got to kill this dude. The three-year-old, there's blood coming from the top of the bunk. And when the police go to check her, she gurgles. She's still oh. alive. So right away, they put her in the police car and they rush her to the trauma center. Oh. So they're working on the three-year-old, but the police are pissed at this moment. Oh, man. Because of what happened to the three and the four, you know, the, the other the other child. Girl. Yeah, and who would do this, you know? So right away now, you can't keep this out of the media. The media is flocking all over. Uh, the police are, you know, are hearing it from the uh, – because now they're finding out there's been some other attacks. And they're like, well, do we link these up? Or are they the same? They don't know about the Lakewood one yet. This is a, another Aurora one. And now they're like, it has to be the same. Another claw hammer has been left at the scene of the crime. There's no fingerprints. And they're just, you know, the captain's yelling at the rest of the police officers, like, you better get something going. And they're like, well, we got to call the FBI in. This is this is over our heads. This one's crazy, you know. And um, it's not, it's, they're trying to figure out when this happened because there's a huge timeline because the last person that talked with them was around nine ten o'clock at night on January 15th, the night before. And it could have been one of those things where they opened up the garage, went to throw out the trash or just didn't close the garage. And then the perpetrator came in and then no one checked on them to the morning time. So it could have been any, any time over the night or the morning, you know, so they have no idea. Man. Are they communicating now with other people? Like, not quite yet. No, oh. you got to man. When, come on, man. So the autopsies were rushed because they wanted to find out as much information as they possibly could, if they could use that, and hopefully finding the perpetrator. They found out that Bruce had been hit sixteen times with a hammer. Oh, sixteen over the head, plus his throat slit. I wonder if the, the claw uh, last uh, uh, slit his throat, or did he have a knife? Um, well, <clears throat> from everything I looked at, there was never a knife found, and this maniac okay. never used a knife, so it probably was the claw hammer. Gosh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You got to be hitting somebody with some force. But to have that many blows, like this guy fought. Yeah. Like yeah. he was not going down easy if he hit him that many times. Yeah, and it's not known where he was first attacked, but it's theorized that he was attacked somewhere else, but then he tried to like slow the perpetrator down from getting upstairs. That's so that's why he wound up on the stairs. I commend him, you know, for trying, you know, on his last breath trying to protect his friend. Yep. Uh, his okay. his wife was struck 11 times. She probably didn't even know what hit her. Well, no, actually she did. She had um, five of which were over the head that finished her off, but she took six to the shoulder and the ribs. So, and the arm. So it was mostly like a defensive, like, Hey, uh, you know what I mean, so they likely were woken up by the initial attack, you know, probably by them down by Bruce and the perpetrator. Yeah. And then, and then, unfortunately, they just had to wait till they, he came up or whatever, you know. It's time to take the plunge. Cold plunging can boost everything from your mood and energy to performance and recovery. Right now, Plunge is offering an exclusive discount of $250 off your order with code HOLIDAY250. Save now at plunge.com. So, man. Yeah. That sucks, dude. Melissa, um... Melissa suffered seven blows to the head and she was raped, the little girl. That's the seven year old. The seven year old, yeah. See that that that's where I have a problem, man. Like you know, it's bad enough you murdered a little child, but then you decide to 
do something that heinous mm-hmm. and raping them like yeah man nah couldn't do it yeah he's gotta go he gotta go his yeah. balls gotta go first and the wing yep no morphine just straight yeah not nah, straight nope hammer to the head I don't care bro nobody needs morphine if you deserve to have your wing cut off you don't need morphine True. That's sick. That's sick, man. Yeah. So, and, and this guy hit the little girl um, three times, Vanessa. So she was hit over the head three times with a hammer. <sighs> Who is this dude? It's not even a dude. Who's this monster? Yeah. I mean, <sighs> look, here. here's the thing, too. And the police are trying to get, like, a task force together. You know, they're trying to, like get the FBI involved. But in the meantime, the, because of what happened with James in the first one mm-hmm. and his, when his wife saying it was a black guy, they put out in the news, we're looking for a, a black guy in a hammer attack. And then we're looking for hippies or transients in this, in these other attacks. So it's, Oh my God. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. They yeah. don't realize it's the same person. Nope. What does it take for that? I mean, come on. A child could figure that out. Yep. It just... So so the media is starting to run with this, and they're pushing the issue. They're the ones that actually get the police to work together because they start investigating and telling the police to check other agencies for other cases in the surrounding areas and lo and behold lakewood pops up with a murder of of the other woman and all of a sudden now the same mo now you can link it to aurora and the denver police are like hey do we need to take control of this because you guys are you know dropping the ball you know like and the media is pressuring everything so the fbi would then would then come in and they set up a task force, brought in a bunch of agencies, and they started to have um, nightly watches, and they would ramp up. They were thinking on the sixth day, you know, January 22nd, we got to be ready because this dude strikes every six days. What if what if we're not ready? So they put a, an unmarked car or, you know, they had people in random neighborhoods looking for anybody suspicious. They were arresting people if they, if they were out at night and didn't look like they were in the right place. They were innocent people. They were just like, dude, we got to catch this guy. We got to stop him. And they would go on to interview over 500 people or potential suspects. Jeez. I wonder, like, like carpenters or, you know, your handyman's around there, were they targeted? Oh yeah, I, I I bet you they 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 got anyone that looked anywhere out of place or looked like they were phony. I mean, they were they were pulling over and taking everybody because they were like, dude, we can't have this happen again. You know, like we got to stop whoever's doing this. Mm-hmm. But and I bet none of those five hundred people were him. You're absolutely correct. None of them were. Now, as we transition in this story, we're going to talk about Vanessa right now. Here's the thing that really sucks. So obviously Vanessa lost her sister, she lost her mother, she lost her father. She would go on through to live with various family members, um, you know, because she had some uncles and aunts and obviously her grandma. But that's tough, you know, you, you lose your family. They're, 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 you know, you're, so she had, because obviously being beaten as severely as she was at the age of three had a lot of PTSD, trauma. She had to go to a lot of uh, hospitals and, you know, get treatment and get better over time. She had, a, you know, some some uh, physical ailments she had to work through. Um, and here's where it sucks. You know, growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, um, she tried to have friends, you know, when she would li- live with various family members through school and, you know, any girl around 12, 13 years old wants to have a sleepover. And mm-hmm. here's what the kids told her when she wanted to have a sleepover. You can't spend the night at our house because the evil hammer man will come get us like he tried to come get you and your family. That's jacked up. So not only does she have the PTSD, she has to deal with kids rubbing it in her face that her family was wiped out 
and that maybe she's the the curse and the evil hammer man will take you know will kill them too I know they're kids, but man, kids can say some evil things, man. Oh, yeah. Kids can be pricks. Absolutely. And she would find this out as she went into high school. Those same mm. kids she grew up with in high school, nobody wanted to be around her. There was a stigma around her. The only kids that would accept her would be your high school stoners. And she mm. got into drugs and addicted to drugs. Mm. Mm. Because of the crap that she went through, the fact that the the perpetrator was still out there, and as the years, All the rejection. what's that? All the rejection, I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, she went through it all, and to numb her pain, drugs were the only outlet, and those those were the only friends that accepted her for who she was. I mean, unfortunate uh, that that was her path. But you know, it, I'm not saying it. It um, it's the only solution she had, but it seemed that way because no one else wanted to kick it with her. You want to kick it with somebody. You want to feel accepted, and for her to be accepted by them, and you know, you want to be in a crowd. So it just sucks that it happened to be them. Absolutely. Yeah. And well, remind me to tell you about like. Well, I'll just tell you now. Like, she's been through so much. You know, obviously, and she looks 10 years older today than what she should look like because of, you know, not only was she addicted to drugs, she got into heavy stuff like meth and cocaine and mm. was living on the streets, um, all kinds of stuff, got arrested and everything. So, I mean, she, this man destroyed her life as well, you know, yeah. obviously now she's, she's recovering addict and, and she's you know, on her feet and stable now, but those years that she spent tortured, you know, she's another yeah. casualty big time. Yeah. Um, but in 2007, this case would be one of the most famous cases in the Denver, Colorado area that was unsolved and various agencies began taking a look at it as DNA progressed. And they were able to withdraw some DNA from the mattress of uh, Deborah's house. And they, in 2007, they were definitively able to realize it was not a black man. Not a black man. So that threw Kim's uh, statements out of the way because not only did they find out it wasn't a black male, but when they tested uh, stuff over at their house, because they found some trace uh, blood from that person, you know, in the scuffle with him and James, um, that one wasn't a black man either. And it mm. was the same blood type too. So they were like, okay, this is in the same, uh, DNA. It's the same dude. So they were, they already knew these cases were linked together, but now they had definitive that they were all linked together by the same guy. So, mm. Um, they were testing DNA at the other ones. And in 2018, which is pretty crazy if you look it up, um, Parabon Nano Labs, which is one of those famous DNA labs, um, in 2018, they were able to get a computer animated look of what the person would look like with the DNA. Mm -hmm. And it, man, it that's looks, crazy. That is crazy. It looks dead on to the real guy. Like it's like, yeah, it's right there, except with a lip, because he has this like cocky looking, like lowered lip, like he's always kind of like half smiling. That's the only part on the computer animation that didn't make it look like a hundred percent. But technology, man. Yeah, dude, it was crazy. So it gave the police a little bit to look at. Now, for whatever reason, here's the. Problem. So we're we're years into because you guys know what CODIS is, right? Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The national, the uh, national DNA, uh, yeah, da database for uh, yeah. offenders. So basically, if you commit a felony, if I commit a felony tomorrow, they automatically take my DNA. They enter it into the system. So mm -hmm. if something I've done in the past, you know, they can it'll just pop up. Yeah, it'll pop up automatically. Or if, or if they're looking for my DNA and like germany they'll find they'll find me you know mm -hmm. i'm screwed um so for whatever reason his dna hadn't been run in codis 
when it had been on CODIS for years. Mm. And so when they decided, hey, let's just run for the hell of it, run his DNA in CODIS, bam, it popped up. Wow. It popped up Idiot. as being on file. So who is this guy? Who is who is the guy that's done all this BS to these people? And that would be one Alex Christopher Ewing. Alex Christopher Ewing. Yes, this is a career criminal. This guy's been in and out of jail for years. You know, he's he's been a bad seed, dude. And he was able to escape the cracks for that many years. Yeah, but there was there was an issue though. The, the so he wasn't exactly see none of it he never popped up in Colorado and then always bothered the police and the FBI because they were like what if he got either killed or what if he fled the state which they felt he did and he actually did when they turned up the heat he got out of there mm. but they were like is he incarcerated and they should have did a better job finding out if he was incarcerated because they would have found him he was incarcerated because 11 days after he killed that family he was over in Arizona and he broke into the house Kingman Arizona to be exact of 31 mm-hmm. year old Roy Williams and he breaks into the house and just like James as Roy is sleeping he wakes him up with a hammer shot over the head mm. But Roy saves his own life without even knowing it. He rolls over with his head gushing blood and starts to pray and tells, you know, Ewing, hey, why are you doing this? Um, You know, he's pleading for his life, but telling him, you know, God loves you. And he's just like saying all these things and pleading for his life at the same time. Ewing just drops the hammer and runs. So he leaves. Wow. And Roy's just sitting there with a massive head wound. I mean, he took a massive shot over the head. Like, one more shot probably killed him. Jeez. Yeah. So he's on the floor, and he's able to roll over and call the police. The police are out looking for a man, you know, that's possibly bloody, a white male. And, uh, you know, one of the sheriffs is driving by, sees a guy walking a little funny. He asks him, hey, man, uh... Do you know anything about uh, anybody, you know, a hammer attack or seeing anyone run? And as soon as he said that, the dude took off and he chases Ewing for about, you know, he gets lost in the neighborhood, but they find him 30 minutes later. He's arrested. His uh, shoe prints match the crime scene. So he's screwed right there. Um, But here's where we have some, uh, (laughs) some more of our awesome Johnsons. Hmm. So they, what, they <laughs> what happened? What they do? So what they do is they have they have a um, they find out when they run his file that he has multiple warrants up in Utah, and he's a he he has for assault, for rape, um, a hammer a, attack up there. <laughs> so it's wow. like they're like you know what he's got more serious warrants we'll take care of those first and then we'll and then if we need to we'll bring him back here and try to um convict him for the attempted murder right yeah so these brilliant officers they take two of them and instead of flying them up there they they take a van ride and they're driving in the van and he says i need to piss i need to piss so they pull over and you can guess what happens he runs. He runs and gets away. Oh my god! Yeah, he he got the out. Old of it. Take a piss trick. <laughs> Could they be stupider? Works every time. <laughs> <laughs> so they they like, how to get out of the van? You let him use the restroom, dummy. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> works so every time. <laughs> this goofy Johnson needs to get his act together. I told you there's a lot of Johnson in this one. Yes. And so um, he he literally <clears throat> um, goes to a coat hanger, tries to get clothes, because that's how people used to dry their clothes, throw them on the coat hanger after washing them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's only able to get shorts. So he gets rid of the orange vest that he was wearing, 
or the orange trench coat or whatever you want to call it. Well, not the jumpsuit. Coat, but the jumpsuit. There you go. And um, he starts going through the neighborhood, knocking on doors. He'll say, oh, I'm a tow truck guy. I need to tow your car. Or, hey, I'm here. I'm a plumber. It's like, no, no, nobody with the service is showing up shirtless. You know what I mean? <laughs> He was better off trying to offer him a magazine or something. Exactly. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, I'm selling dictionaries. Um, so he was so so. Some neighbors started calling nine one one, and obviously, you know, they're like, "Oh my god, we have a convict out there! It's got to be the guy." So, all points bulletin. Here come all the cops into the neighborhood. But before he could, you know, get caught. He goes into Christopher Barry's house. He's 38 with his wife, 24. So good on Christy, 14 years younger. That's that's awesome. Um, but they have a, the heck up. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Old Todd sneaking one in. <laughs> Couldn't hold back. I'm sorry. Um, he pulled a Todd. Yeah, shut up. <laughs> it's just 10 years. Um, so anyway, <laughs> the, um, he he. He actually gets in the house because it's unlocked, and some of these people with unlocked doors. Yeah, I mean, come on, man. I mean, you got to be more trust, you know, not not that trustworthy, but or trusting. Yeah. But yeah. um, yeah, unfor- correct yourself before somebody does. Yes. <laughs> um, but the problem is, she has a small infant in her hands, so like less oh. than, less than a year old, and she's so, just so. Getting, she's getting the infant meal ready for him. And he storms in the house. He sees her. They lock eyes. She makes a beeline to the bedroom where her husband is. And her husband's just like sort of knocked out on the bed. He gets up right away. Just as Ewing's trying to swing a piece of wood at her. And he kind of hits her. But she has the baby and she kind of like lands on the bed, kind of rolls off the bed, but cradles the baby to where the baby's not thankfully hurt or the baby takes any kind of brunt other than maybe hitting the bed at first the soft top of the bed so all things i saw the baby was not harmed whatsoever baby was fine so he just took a shot to her back protecting the baby thankfully uh the he's not anticipating the husband being there so the husband and him get into a um what do you call it a tussle and then he's hit over the head but then he's able to shield his wife and he flees out the front door but really? ewing, ewing doesn't get too far <laughs> he runs into the back forest area um the the fbi and police and and uh what is it police dogs f- uh, sniff him out of there uh the next day so he's you know so he gets he gets arrested obviously right there and uh it's august 11th 1984 when he goes to jail he goes to a maximum security jail in utah where he's found guilty of all the other charges that he would uh, that he incurred or that he occurred uh, before with the warrants. And then also uh, they didn't even try him for the one down in uh, Arizona because they felt he got enough years. He got 59 years at that time. Mm. So what? Why the hell didn't they pin everything? Because at that because at that point it was they didn't know about the stuff in Colorado. So they knew of a rape. They knew of an uh uh, attempted murder and battery plus um, what is it called he was also uh, he stole some stuff so he was caught there um, and then the, then obviously the jail break so he got 59 years at that point and I think at that point he was uh, he was somewhere around his mid 30s at that time or early 30s so they were figuring that would be a death sentence right there but he was up for parole in 2021. <laughs> what? Yeah. And so he never got charged for Colorado? Well, here's the thing. He was thinking he was going to be let loose and it would have been, you know, 2 years ago. However, in 2018 when when that when they had uh, the Panabon Nar- Nano Labs did that whole thing and then they threw it into CODIS, he popped up in 2018 and right mm. away all those homicides were linked to him. And uh, because of that, he was extradited to Denver. And in 20, uh, I think it was right after, yeah, it was uh, last year, uh, 2022, I believe, or the early part of 2022, it was after COVID calmed down. They mm-hmm. uh, they sentenced him to, uh, what is it, three consecutive life 
sentences without parole. They did link the murders to him and the uh, the attacks in, in uh, Aurora and Lakewood. However, they did not seek the death penalty for whatever reason. I don't know if that was the family's wishes, but they did not seek the death penalty. Mm, mm, mm. So that's where Mr. Ewing is right now. He's rotting in prison in Denver. That guy's a parasite. They should have cut him. Yep. Oh, man. That was uh, the oldest he... unsolved case mm. in Denver. Dang. Well, Mr. Ewing got away lightly, in my opinion. I agree. He I'm deserved sorry. the worst you... of the worst. I'm sorry. When you, when you cause harm on children and do something like raping them. Yeah, you you lose all you lose all the rights to me. That, that that should be it for you. And here's the thing too, I mean this guy was scum of the earth. I mean like you use a weapon like that, like you want you want that kind of like um just overkill type mentality. Like a gun is so like I mean guns are bad too, obviously, but yeah, like you said, like it's Usually, if you shoot someone in the head, that's it. You know, they don't feel nothing else. I mean, but you're, you're, the brutality of those attacks, man. I mean, again, like the seasoned veterans detective were, or the seasoned detectives that were veterans of the force were like, oh my God, this is like the worst thing we've ever seen. <clears throat> yeah, he wanted to hurt people, he wanted to cause pain. Yep. Yep. He that's clearly got off of that. And the one thing he said too, because he didn't say much other than he never confessed to a lot of stuff. But the one thing he did say when they were interviewing him was that it, he would just look for an unlocked door or a open garage. And there was a few times where he was, he was either scared off because there's too many people in the home or just didn't look right. So there was potentially there could have been a a lot more victims or different victims and those people don't know how lucky they were why didn't he run up in someone's house with a and it was a ccw yeah mm. he got lucky sure did sure did and um you guys were right he was like a transient type dude low life you know oh you were right Reed. he smelled like one i could smell him from 1984 <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But this guy, if you look him up, he's um he looks like a like a total a hole, like from the start. Like his earliest mug shots are like when he's like seventeen or eighteen. So he's just always been a scumbag. Um he was he's been accused of rape ever since his teens. Oh man. So what's he, the full name again? Uh Christopher oh, I had it right here. Hold on. His name's Christopher Ewing or something? Yeah, it's it's uh Alex Christopher Ewing. Alex, yeah. Now, if he would have said, if he would have said Patrick, I'd have been like, "Hey, he's definitely black." <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Ewing. Ew. You see that little smirk on his face? Oh yeah. He's disgusting looking. He looks diabolical. Yeah. And he had the he had the um. He had an outburst in prison where the, I guess the victim impact statements were being read and, you know, the, the victims were telling him about, uh, you know, what they, you know, how he caused everything and the, the pain and suffering in their lives. And he had the nerve to out like say, you know, cause you're not supposed to interrupt them when they're talking. And he was like, Oh my God, this isn't fair. You know, why are you guys doing this to me? <laughs> People wanted to just what? Reach. Yeah, they wanted to reach over the side of that. Those little. No, I would have, man. I would have my temper. This isn't fair. Yep. I would have lost it. I'm, I'm sorry. I would have lost it, bro. The fact that the scumbag piece of trash is alive—that's not fair. They would have held me in contempt. I would have jumped over and tried to do something as quick as possible, man. For him to have the audacity to say something like that. Yep. Yeah, right. 
Do <sighs> you guys see the family? The Bennett family? No. If you look at him up, look at him up. I don't want to. He does have that smug look. Kind of like a... Well, not William Defoe. William Defoe. He has a, a, a little look of William Defoe. He looks like a disgusting piece of crap. Yep. Well, he is... I hope he gets it. Rotting, even though he should have been somewhere else. Uh, but I, not, and look, I know we don't wish death on anybody, but he... He crossed Monsters the line. Monsters like that don't need to be alive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some there's some pictures on here where like I gotta I gotta show you um uh because I have some of the crime scene photos of not not of the the the, the people that passed away, but the ones that survived. And uh, man, I mean, it, it's it's not uh you know it just shows you what a hammer like that could do with force and this guy had no remorse whatsoever he did not care obviously taking it out on kids and and people so oh, it's just rough yeah was um melissa there or vanessa yeah she was there she was there she was dealing with it with everything but um yeah i gotta show you a picture of what she looks like now and Again, poor thing looks like she's had it rough, you know, or, or had a rough life. You know, you could look at someone, you're like, damn, you know, like they've been through something. They've yeah, seen and, and and it's understandable, you know, what she went through. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. I'm not I'm not victim shaming at all. I'm just saying, like, like, damn, you know, like, or or making light of the subject, not at all. It's just the fact that, you know, unfortunately, you go through something like that, you're not going to have an easy life, and then being tormented by freaking stupid kids on top of it, it's like that's that messed. sucks. Well, I'm, you know, I'm sure she got the help that she needed, at, you know, all these years. Yeah. Yeah. She's she's in a much better place now, thankfully. If, um, you know, if you were to see like, uh, because there is a, a a video, they did a video on it, but um, but other than that, I mean, I mean, she had to endure a lot. I mean, that's stuff you just you just can't get rid of. Even at the tender age of three, it's like, damn, dude, you know. Yeah. Yeah, man, he ruined her life. Yep. Man, it's hard to come back from something like that. Mm. But that's the case. Wow. Well, thank you, Todd Fox, for breaking down that story for us. Um, Very touching, um, but we appreciate that. And we want to thank you guys for listening in to your favorite trio. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Um, with all that being said, we're about to sign off. But before we do, I want to remind you guys where you can find us. Go on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, YouTube. Type in Grinding True Crimes. Uh, if you want to listen to us once again on your podcast screen, you can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Anchor, iTunes, Pandora, Pod, Podvine, and Zencaster. And for those outside of the U.S., Radio Public, Breaker, Pocket Cast, and Podchaser. So with that being said, we're signing out. This has been the Grind True Crime with your host Maddie Matt, along with Gabby Gab and Todd Fox, and we're out of here. Off with their wing. <laughs> That's different. <laughs> and and don't be a Johnson. <laughs> well, now I got to say something. Uh, eat your Wheaties. What? <laughs> so eat your Wheaties. <laughs> Take your knife, <NyQuil>, bro. <laughs> Southern California Edison quiere que estés seguro cuando trabajes al aire libre. No intentes ni contrates a alguien para podar o cortar árboles que estén cerca de cables eléctricos. Llama primero al 800-655-4555. Más información en scce.com diagonal stay safe.